Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome once again to uh, Christchurch Bligari. Hope you're comfortable in your homes. The psalmist in Psalm 11 writes, In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird? And then he says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is is on his heavenly throne. What a joy to come and know that in spite of what we're going through, the Lord is ruling. The king is on the throne. But not only is he on the throne, he's ever present with us. So welcome. And let me pray. Lord, we pray as we spend this time together this morning that you, our king, our savior, would be present with us. Touch us deeply with the gospel. May your spirit work deeply in us. We ask in your precious name. Amen. Well, folks, just a couple of things uh, this morning. Um, I just want to say straight away thank you to all those who are supporting the church financially. I know for many of you these are difficult times, but thank you to those who are helping us uh, financially to keep the gospel going here at Christ Church Blegari. And then secondly, I think we all agree, and uh, a big thank you to our Helping Hands team, and also to the Bread of Life woman who have been cooking uh, all sorts of meals, which have been taken to a number of families. Let's continue to pray for many families, not only here, but at our other churches that are battling, and let's continue to support them. So thank you to all those who are doing that. Can I also remind you that... um, We are doing daily meditations every morning. If you aren't receiving those and you'd like to be uh, part of that meditation, then do let us know, and we'll make sure you get those every morning. And again, thank you to our uh, children's and youth workers for the work they're doing during this lockdown as well. Thank you to all of you, and I pray that we have a wonderful service together this morning. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, He reigns forever, our hope, our strong
We're now entering into a time of pastoral prayer, so please bow your heads and pray with me. We pray today for all at Christ Church Blegari in this difficult time of both economic lockdown and the coronavirus pandemic. Lord, be with all of those who are suffering and who need your help in our congregation. We mention particularly Catherine Dubé, whose mother died this week, and pray for Joyce Stimson and Jean Dundas. Our Helping Hands ministry has been handing out food parcels and vouchers to families that are struggling both in our congregation as well as in the Leondale and Hillbrow communities. We give thanks to all those who have worked hard to make this happen and all those who have contributed to this important ministry. Lord, we give you particularly this day our president and his cabinet, and we pray for wisdom and integrity for all those who are guiding and leading our country at this time. May the food parcels reach those in need, and we pray for all those in government and all the NGOs that are involved in their distribution. Balancing the nation's health with the economic well-being of our country is an extremely difficult task, and we pray that through servant leadership, we as a country come out of this pandemic with as little damage as possible and as few deaths as possible. Please join me now in a prayer to our loving God. Loving Lord, if we are ill, strengthen us. If we are tired, fortify our spirits. If we are anxious, help us to consider the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. Don't let fear cause us to overlook the needs of others more vulnerable than ourselves. Fix our eyes on your story and our hearts on your grace. Help us always to hold fast to the good, see the good in others, and remember that there is just one world, one hope, one everlasting love with baskets of bread for everyone. In Jesus we make our prayer, the one who suffered, died, and was raised to new life, in whom we trust these days and all days. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from Luke 4, verses 1 to 13. Satan tempts Jesus. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness being tempted for forty days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil Taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you, and, in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Here ends the reading. Good morning, everyone. Let us pray. Father, as we come to your word, give me grace now to speak your word and to encourage your people. Open our hearts, open our minds. Help us to learn from you this morning. Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, there's often a misconception, a misunderstanding among 
among Christians, especially amongst those who are still young in the faith, uh, that becoming a follower of Christ now means that uh, we do not struggle with sin anymore. That temptation is now a thing of, a thing of the past. That to be in the spirit now means to be untroubled by sin. But that's not really what happens, is it? Um, at least that's not what I experienced uh, when I decided to follow Christ. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Um, to me, it felt like my struggle with sin, my battle with sin intensified a hundredfold as I became more and more aware of my own sinfulness, as I became more sensitive to sin both in myself and in the world around me. Brothers and sisters, your coming to Christ, your coming to Christ does not diminish the power of temptation and sin over you. You do not become immune to temptation and sin when you come to Christ. In fact, you become a target of the devil and his angels. And that's because of the image, the image of Christ that is being formed in you. There is something about Christ in you, and that's why you become the, ta the target of temptation and sin. Fortunately, you're not the first one, and you're not the only one to struggle against sin. The Bible says that we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. How did Jesus overcome temptation? Well, before we look at our text this morning, let's, let's just rewind for a moment. Let's, let's just go back to see how we got here. Let's step back to chapter 3, where Jesus, of course, was baptized by John the Baptist uh, in the River Jordan. Two things happened there. Two things happened. The Holy Spirit descended from heaven like a dove on Jesus, and a voice from heaven said these words, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Now, these words are very, very important. They are very important. They are key to understanding this passage, this temptation narrative. Because, you see, here God makes a declaration, a public declaration for everyone to see, saying, here is my Messiah. Here is my son. Here is my anointed one. Yes, I guess you could almost say that it was Jesus' coronation as king, as the son of God. You could say that. Because you see, Jesus then represents the father on earth. He does the will of the father on earth. He is the obedient son. And so the spirit comes upon him and he is anointed with the power of God from on high. So, Folks, this is the background of it all. This is the context. This is the catalyst, if you want, which led to this clash between Jesus and the devil in this passage that we are going to look at now. So what happens next? What happens next? Well, the same spirit that baptized him now leads him into the wilderness. It says there, verse 1, Then, the devil, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, remember he was just anointed now, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. Into the wilderness. The wilderness is a harsh place. It's a hostile place. It's very cold at night. 
It's very hot and dry during the day. And Jesus, we are told, was there for 40 days and 40 nights. Being tempted, it says. He was being tempted, which is probably not the right word. Not quite. I think it's more accurate to say that he was being tested by the devil. He was being tested by the devil. Why am I saying that? Well, Jesus has just been declared the son of God. He's just been declared son of God. Now it was time to put that to the test. Is he really the real deal? And that's why if you look, if you read through this passage, you, you, you keep hearing these phrases, uh, the specific phrase, if you are the son of God. Or you could also put it this way, since you are the son of God. Well, let's see, temptation number one. Luke says Jesus was starving at the end of those 40 days of fasting, uh, prayer and fasting in the desert. And of course, you know how we human beings are, what we are capable of when we are hungry. We are capable of anything, anything to keep us from starving. Look at you now, Jesus of Nazareth, poor thing, so hungry. Hmm? Shame. And there's only rocks and stones here in the desert? Really? Is that what your father wants for you? Rocks and stones? Oh, wait, I've got an idea. The devil says, since you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, why don't you just use your powers? and turn these stones into bread. Come on, it's the most reasonable thing to do. What are you waiting for? Save yourself, if you are the Son of God. And as you can imagine, that must have been tempting for Jesus, especially if you have the power to do it. You are hungry, you are starving. But, was it the Father's will for him to turn those stones into bread and save himself from starvation? No, says Jesus. I will wait upon the Lord. I will wait upon the Father to provide for me. Yes, right here in the desert, here in the wilderness, just like he did with our forefathers. But you are hungry, Jesus. You have to eat now. It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but upon every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Of course, Jesus here is quoting from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, which actually reads like that. The whole quote actually reads something like this. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, verse 3. It says, this is Moses speaking to the Israelites in the desert. It says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known. Why? To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. He humbled you causing you to hunger. Why? To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. What Jesus is saying is this. What he's going through now in the desert, what he's experiencing now is the same test that Israel experienced, the people of, of God experienced many, many years ago in the wilderness, where they were for 40 years Jesus is reenacting what happened to them in the wilderness. Of course, they failed miserably, but Jesus would succeed, you see. He would be obedient to the, he would be obedient to the Father, unlike Israel of old. Temptation number two. The devil says to him, look, look, look at all these kingdoms, all the kingdoms of the world in all their glory and their splendor. Those Fortune 500 companies, 
that prime real estate, the, the oil companies, the revenues, you know, it will all be yours. You will be the most powerful man on earth. Forget about Donald Trump. All of this will be yours if you just do me a small favor, the devil says. Just a small favor. Just one bow. Just one bow before me and you are there. One bow and you are there. It's the shortest. Come on, you must admit it, Jesus. It is the shortest, the fastest route to the crown. And of course, you can get there without the cross. Without the cross. Do you want to die like a criminal on a cross, on a tree? Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? I've got a better idea. And it will cost you nothing. All I ask you is to bow down before me and worship me. This is the devil's proposal. Folks, this was no light temptation, mind you. Remember Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane? My father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. Take this cup from me, Jesus says. But not as I will, but as you will. Choosing the root of the cross was not easy for Jesus. It was hard. A hard and agonizing experience for Jesus. But he was determined to do the Father's will. Then Jesus answers the devil and he says to him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Of course, it would have been much easier, wouldn't it, to receive the crown without the cross? And yet it's the same with us today. We too face that kind of temptation where we are, school, at work. We know the best thing to do is to be ethical in how we work, in our work. But of course, if we are willing to, you know, now and then just look the other way, you know, we can get that promotion. Just look away and see, you know, as if we hadn't seen anything. But at what cost? At what cost? What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Jesus says. What good? Is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Temptation number three. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, since you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Prove it. Jump, the devil says. Let's see if your father will protect you. Didn't your father say he will protect you? Look, it's written here in the scriptures, Jesus. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. It says there, they will lift up, they will lift you up in their arms so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Your own father said it. Well, prove it. Let's see if it's true. I mean, Jesus, you've got to admit it would have been great, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, the angels sort of carried you on their wings. You know, you would sort of just float down from the roof, down there to the crowds. You'll be a celebrity instantly. The crowds will love it. And you will be crowned right there as king, as Messiah. And of course, you wouldn't have to go to a cross. You wouldn't have to die on the cross like a, a common criminal. Jesus answers the devil and says to him, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. This is not an invitation to experiment with God. You see? To see if God is going to catch me or not. To see if this Christian thing works. You see? It's an invitation to trust and obey. 
to walk with God, not to test the Lord. Look at Israel, what happened to them in the desert when they tried to test the Lord in the wilderness, when they questioned God's truthfulness, God's faithfulness, despite all the evidence. You see, testing is the essence of unbelief. The essence of unbelief, it reveals a lack of trust. And that's why Moses said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And Jesus said, well, I'll stick with that, thank you. I'll stick with that. Dear brothers and sisters, followers of Christ, your coming to Christ does not make you immune against sin, against sin and temptation. No, it doesn't. It's quite the opposite, as I said. It intensifies the struggle with sin and temptation. And it's the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in you. The struggle against sin and temptation. You will be tempted exactly as Jesus was tempted. You will be tempted with consumption. You will be tempted with security, with status. You will be tempted to provide for yourself, to protect yourself, to exalt yourself. So please don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Satan wants to destroy your faith in God. Satan wants you to question the fatherhood of God over you. Satan wants you to test God. If you are the son of God, Satan wants you to cast off the fatherhood of God over you. Satan wants to father you. He wants you to become his son. He wants you to become his daughter. Can you imagine that? But that's what he wants. He wants your allegiance. He wants your loyalty. He wants your obedience. He wants to be your provider. He wants to be your blesser, as they say. So don't be surprised. It's nothing personal. It's just that you look a little bit too much like Jesus, you see. It's just that your spirit, your soul, looks a lot like the spirit of Jesus. You remind him too much of Jesus, amen? And that's the problem, you see. That's why he's coming after you, my dear brother, my dear sister. He sees that you are serious about Jesus, so hang in there. Fortunately, Christ has already gone before us, and he's already defeated the devil and his angels. And because of that, because of that, you can resist the devil. As Peter says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You too can overcome sin and temptation by trusting God and by believing his word. Let us pray. Lord, teach us to confront our temptations. Teach us, Lord, not to pursue our own comfort, our own security and control outside of your will, even when we have the power to do it, Lord. Teach us to draw upon your word to resist the devil and to resist evil. And Lord, we pray, Lord, in this testing time in which we find ourselves, Our Father in heaven, we pray, lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation, Lord. We we pray, we plead with you, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil, Lord. Give us the grace, Lord, in this time of testing and trial. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. And we pray, Father, that you will provide for us in this time of trial, in this time of temptation, 
in this wilderness in which we find ourselves in this world today in 2020. We pray, Lord, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thursday was Ascension Day, and so will you join me in our Ascension prayers. Will you please say with me the words in bold? Christ has gone up on high. Alleluia. God raised Christ from the dead and enthroned him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. God put all things in subjection beneath his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. We died and our life lies hidden with Christ in God. We set our minds on things above. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then we too will be revealed with him in glory. Christ has gone up on high. Alleluia. We confess our sins together. Risen, ascended Lord. We confess this morning that so often we get caught up in structures and in the institution of the church. We get so easily caught up in ourselves and our own feelings and our own needs that we forget that you have called us to take the gospel to people from every nation and every tribe and every language. O oh Lord, forgive us for our passion for the gospel. Forgive us that we forget to love you with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and to love our neighbor as ourselves. O oh Lord, risen Ascended Lord, forgive us. Let's take a moment of quiet. As quietly we confess to him our sins, our neglect of his call on our lives to take the gospel and to demonstrate the gospel. Jesus Christ, the risen, ascended Lord, is our salvation, our eternal glory. And he has forgiven us and washed us clean of all our sins. Trust in him and know forgiveness. We praise you, our Lord, our Saviour. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. My light, my strength, my soul, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving sees my comforter. flesh, the fullness of God in helpless being, the 
His gift of love and righteousness and scorned with the ones He came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on Him was laid Here in the death of Christ darkness slain then burst and forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Thank you for tuning into our service. We hope God has spoken to your heart in some way through this message. Our church is committed to spreading the gospel to all people. In order to do this, we run various ministries to support the homeless and less fortunate. We also support other churches in lesser income areas. In order to do this, we rely on the contributions and donations from our congregation. In this time of isolation and lockdown, we need these contributions more than ever. Since we are no longer able to meet together at our church, We cannot collect your offerings as we usually do. It is for this reason, if your heart leads you to, that we ask for your contributions to be done through one of our two electronic mediums. The first is the usual EFT, and our banking details are listed below. Secondly, you can contribute through Zapper. If you would like to know how to set up Zapper, please see the Zapper video on our channel.